I am just really thrilled to uh, welcome all of you uh, speakers and guests alike to this presentation um, on ambition. I'm going to say a few words about Econa. I'll introduce the speakers. And then um, my goal is to pretty much get out of the way because we have a wonderful um, group of people who've come together to, um, to join us today. Um, so this, uh, this masterclass is being presented by Econa. It's a center of excellence for entrepreneur mental wellness. And we do um, three things. We're focused on education and awareness programs. That's what's happening today. And our goal here is to kind of destigmatize and normalize entrepreneur mental health differences. We create customized um, services and programs for uh, ecosystem stakeholders. Uh, we've worked with venture capital firms, entrepreneur networks and accelerators and incubators primarily. Uh, to develop um, programs that address specific uh, groups of entrepreneurs. And then we also do some research focused on conducting population-based entrepreneur mental health needs assessments. So for specific um, uh, groups of entrepreneurs, that's kind of what Econa has been about for the last year. And the reason we do this is because um, uh, mental health symptoms can derail founders, and we're going to hear about that from Eric soon. But when a, an entrepreneur gets derailed by mental health symptoms, it not only affects the individual, but also the company and the ecosystem uh, uh, and has kind of significant ripple effects. Uh, and so we think that um, it's important to be aware of the um, maintaining the mental health stability of entrepreneurs, and we're looking for ways to, um, to bring that about. Just to give you a high level orientation, this, this diagram shows kind of my view of entrepreneur uh, mental health differences. The green circle here represents all entrepreneurs. And as you can see, all entrepreneurs have a personality and these personality traits that Dr. Johnson will talk about. Um, go a long way to explain why entrepreneurs do what they do. The blue circle kind of represents the universe of uh, people with mental health conditions. And as you can see, there's a large overlap. A lot of entrepreneurs, 38% uh, in our last study, um, have pre-existing mental health conditions. And then if that weren't enough, the gold circle here at the bottom represents people with mental health symptoms, entrepreneurs with mental health symptoms that get triggered by just doing what you do as an entrepreneur. Um, and so it's what you bring to the party and what the party brings to you. You know, briefly high level on the side of the slide are some people that I, you know, we've kind of gotten to know um, who are entrepreneurs who committed suicide and the data here in the middle are findings from a study that um, Dr. Johnson and I did with Dr. Sangeeta Badal, um, a very large study with great methods where we found that 38% uh, of a, a large population of entrepreneurs have these mental health conditions. 3% made suicide attempts and 1.7% um, reported a history of psychiatric hospitalization. So we're talking about big numbers and it really illustrates kind of why I think it's, uh, it's urgent for us to address this dimension of entrepreneurship. Because if you're a policy person who believes that um, entrepreneurship is a pathway to economic development and prosperity, what you need to know is that that cannot happen without building around people who have these mental health differences. That's the high level. And now we're going to talk about ambition and we're gonna learn about it from three people who know what they're, what they're talking about. 
Um, I'm going with the Elvis Presley definition of ambition. He said, ambition is a dream with a V8 engine. Uh, I think that uh, Sherry Johnson will give us a better definition eventually. But um, by pulling together an entrepreneur, an, an investor, and a, a, a academic researcher, I think we've tried to create an emotionally intelligent ecosystem here to understand the issues. Um, first, let me introduce Jake Chapman. Uh, Jake is the uh, co-founder and managing partner at Alpha Bridge Ventures, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm that's kind of focused on tech. Um, he, uh, as an investor, helped to launch a, a mental health program with some of his um, executive coach and mental health colleagues that serves um, entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley. And he and his um, investors uh, in, believe that the mental health of the entrepreneur is, a, is an important asset. And so they have found ways to invest in, um, well, like it says in the article, they basically they pay you to get therapy. So Jake, next time I I'm looking for um, a Series A, I'm going to be knocking on your door. Uh, he graduated from um, UC Berkeley School of Law and, uh, and was a, uh, a lawyer um, for venture capital firms before becoming an entrepreneur, starting a couple of companies, and then becoming a venture capitalist. Over here on the left, I also want to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Sherry Johnson. Sherry's a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and she also runs the California Mania Lab, um, acronym COM. One of these days, if you have a chance, ask her what they do over there. Um, she's a, an internationally recognized researcher on bipolar disorder, personality, impulsivity, um, of, and entrepreneurship. And uh, with this group I mentioned, uh, we've had several publications in the last several years, including this one that um, uh, explores the overlap between personality traits, mania, and entrepreneurship. Um, it's only one of her 200 publications, including five books. Very prolific and productive and a wonderful person. And then um, we're uh, really pleased to include my friend Eric Severinghouse. Eric is a serial entrepreneur. He's been uh, entrepreneuring for 20 years. Um, he's launched a bunch of companies, has created thousands of jobs, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, and uh, has the, his companies include Simple Relevance, Rise Interactive, Spring CM. Uh, his acquisitions include being acquired by Docu DocuSign. He's the recipient of the Chicago Innovation Award and he's a mountaineer. And if you look over at the picture of Eric here, uh, down below, you can see his boots looking down from the top of Mount Everest, which he decided to climb after um, a, a couple of his entrepreneurial adventures. Eric uh, graduated from UNC Keenan Flagler uh, Business School and got his MBA in entrepreneurship at Northwestern University. And so I'm going to Eric, just ask you one question here to kick it off. And then if you could explain to us where all this ambition came from, uh, how it worked for you and how it didn't. Uh, I wanna give you a lot of credit. In your, in your book, I'm, I lifted a paragraph. You say, I compensated for the hard times with too much booze and compulsive exercise among other things. The anxiety led me to my own personal and more terrifying death zone. The fear I was going to have a heart attack at 29, coupled with fantasies about jumping in front of the L train to make the pain go away. Um, so that would be suicidal thoughts and thank you for disclosing that. As the pressure to quit became overwhelming, I spent so much time and emotional energy trying to figure out how to keep our company solvent 
that I forgot to focus on keeping myself alive. How did you keep the company solvent? How did you keep yourself self alive? What was your mental health journey? And um, I'm gonna just encourage people to read your book. I read it, it's great. And it has a lot of wisdom to share as well. So thank you for that. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And thanks so much for having me, Dr. Freeman. Um, not only did Dr. Freeman read it, he wrote the foreword, which was an incredible honor for me. And, and I, I just wanna say, you know, again, thank you. It, it feels like in some ways my journey's come full circle as, as I reach some of the darkest places. And, you know, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but as I reach some of the darkest places of my journey, one of the few things that I found that helped me understand that other people were going through what I was going through was your paper, the Our Entrepreneurs Touched with Fire. And, and I know I'm certainly not the only one. I'm seeing a few heads nod. I know I'm certainly not the only one that read that and, and felt like, did, did he write that about me? And so having read that paper and then having had the opportunity to get to know you and, and then now having the opportunity to come you know, speak with you on this topic is just, um, it's, it's an incredibly powerful experience and I really do appreciate it. Um, it you know, as as you mentioned, and, and as you read from the book, and no matter how many times uh, I've, I've read that paragraph, and as, as you're editing a book, you end up reading your paragraph so many times that the words all blur together. And yet every time I read that, or, or every time um, my wife reads it, 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 it still kind of like wells up this lump in my throat of remembering what that period of my life was like. And it seems very foreign to me now, but boy, it, it, it felt so real at the moment. And it was, um, you know, I, I, I guess maybe to give you guys a little bit of quick background in my journey, you talk about, I don't know if there's a gene or I'm sure uh, Dr. Johnson will have more research on this, but for me, I was always the, the kid from middle school through high school, through college. I was always that guy, the, the overachiever, right? Whether it was salutatorian of my high school class. I remember a friend one time telling me, you know, Eric, it is possible to join a club without being the president of that club. And like, for me, that just never happened. Anything that I joined, I wanted to be the leader of. Anything that I was leading, I wanted to make, you know, bigger and better and broader and grander and, and all of those kinds of things. And I had actually been through the entrepreneurial journey a few times before I started what, what's really the subject of the book, which is a company called Simple Relevance. And I had helped friends start companies that we had had great successes in. I had started companies that we would call learning experiences, which is you know entrepreneurial euphemism for abject failure. And I had probably helped start something like 12 companies um, in, in some way, shape or form before I quit IBM while I was in the middle of my Kellogg journey and decided to start Simple Relevance full time. And, you know, I, I went through some of the predictable ups and downs in that journey. And, and you know, Dr. Freeman was kind enough to introduce me with, with all of the accolades and, and a lot of the cool things that I've done, some fun exits and, and, you know, from a mountaineering experience, making it to the top of Mount Everest, like a lot of really neat things. But what into the bios for speakers that get invited to come talk to entrepreneurs about entrepreneurship. Um, I just want to check real quick. Is my audio still okay, Dr. Freeman? Okay. All right. If my audio gets funny, just like, let me know and I'll cut off the video so you can at least hear me. Um, what so rarely makes it into the biography is the hard times, the challenges, the failures, the shutdowns. I was having this conversation with, uh, with some students at University of Chicago the other day, and I was talking about some of my hard times, and, and they brought up um, a friend of mine who's one of the most successful entrepreneurs in Chicago, and, and they said, yeah, you know, he never, he never talks about all those companies that failed, and, and it's just incredibly true. There's tremendous selection bias in terms of, um, in terms of who gets invited and, and who gets to share and then what stories they share, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to change a little bit of that and, and tell you guys about some of the challenges that I went through in the hopes that um, it, it can help it, it can help sort of um, help contextualize the entrepreneur's journey in a way that Dr. Freeman, your, your paper did so well for me. So I, I guess going back to it, I started Simple Relevance. We raised a couple rounds of venture capital. 
raising that capital was really difficult up until that point in my life. It was the hardest thing that I think that I'd ever done. I always assumed that there were these guys out there like Jake that just had these checkbooks and that they would recognize, you know, somebody like me and say, Oh man, this guy seems smart. His idea seems cool. Um, let's, uh, let's write him a check. And it ended up being substantially more difficult than I thought that it was going to be, but it was difficult in the way that I'm really good at things being difficult. It was, it was harder than I thought, but as long as I keep working hard at it, I would eventually figure out how to solve the puzzle. And I would figure out how to, how to put some capital together. I'd figure out how to put a team together. And so it was one of those difficult experiences that as I worked on it more, as I went up that learning curve, I felt increasingly proficient and I was able to validate that with, you know, some external success. Like I raised some money, I got people to work for me. We got some sales success, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what ended up happening is I went through a period of time where we weren't meeting goals and we weren't achieving the success that we thought that we would. And by that point, I was in many ways the poster child for entrepreneurship in Chicago. We had just opened this brilliant new center, um, the, what is, I think, oftentimes the number one ranked um, entrepreneurial co-working space in the world, what is now a crowded space, a, a, a thing called 1871. And I was one of the first companies in there. And I was literally on the cover of, of our local kind of business magazine as like hitting the startup sweet spot. And this guy knows what he's doing, right? And at the same time, the company was really struggling. We had this great pipeline of sales opportunities that we were really struggling to convert to revenue. We had a couple of huge customers that we thought we were doing a great job for, but it wasn't clear if they were going to renew with us or not. Um, we were quickly running out of capital, um, partly due to exogenous circumstances and partly, probably mostly due to bad decisions that I made around how, you know, we didn't raise enough capital, we didn't manage the capital well enough, et cetera, et cetera. And I ended up finding myself in some really dark places as an entrepreneur. And, and Dr. Freeman, you referenced one of the awards that I won. At one point, I was literally being handed awards and, and I couldn't even contemplate it. Um, I, I, I couldn't even hardly accept the award because I felt like such a fraud. I felt like such a failure. And this for me, this sense of imposter syndrome, this was the much more difficult part of the journey for me because it wasn't something I could just work harder and, and then figure out. In fact, what I didn't realize at the time, but I was working so hard that it was actually becoming counterproductive. I was working 80, 90, 100 hours. I was not insisting, but let's say strongly suggesting that my team adopt a similar level of intensity and a, and a similar modality that I do. And um, it was burning them out as well. And it wasn't healthy for them. The more the, the, things just continued to seem like they weren't going to go well. And, and I could... Um, I could talk through kind of the, the ups and downs of the entrepreneurial journey all day long and give you guys the play by play. Um, but it, it became the point where I had to face failure really for the first time. It's not to say that I'd never failed at things before. There's certainly things that hadn't, that hadn't gone well. You know, there had been teams I'd been cut from or things like that, but I had never so closely associated myself with an ambitious undertaking and then had to stare directly in the face of that failure. And that was an incredibly difficult thing for a type A overachiever like me to figure out how the hell do you do that? And what made that perhaps worse is the fact that if you look at almost all of the advice that gets given to entrepreneurs outside of Dr. Freeman, some of the, the God's work that you're doing here with Econa, and a couple of other organizations that are out there really, really, I, I think, trying to change this narrative. But if you look at most of the advice that gets given to that is given to entrepreneurs, it's things like do more faster and hustle harder and grind more and take more risk put more of, of your own, uh, you know, put, put more on the line. Like that's, that's what the heroes of our entrepreneurial stories always do, right? They're always the ones that risked it all and it somehow ended up working out. I had risked it all. 
Like I'd put every dollar of my personal money that I had combined with raising friends and family money, combined with taking on institutional investment. I had worked as hard as I could. I had felt like I had done everything right and it wasn't working. Like it, 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 I came face to face with the fact that this company was not going to achieve my ambitions. And that was this mental break that was really, really hard for me to process. And that was where, you know, Dr. Freeman, you, you referenced the sort of suicidal ideation, the drinking too much to try and turn my brain off, some of those things that happened. And it, it really came from that. It came from that idea that I was feeling like a failure, that my friends would look at me as a failure, that my family would view me as a failure, that everybody I knew in Chicago would view me as a failure, that, that I was this fraud and this imposter that was forever going to be branded a failure. And at some point it went through my head and I know I'm not unique in this because I've talked to plenty of other entrepreneurs that have had similar feelings of like, do I, do I even want to deal with that? Like, is it easier to just not go on? How, how do I even live life branded a failure? And the unfortunate reality is, you know, something on the order of 75% of venture backed companies will not end up returning meaningful capital to investors. They will be quote unquote failures. And there's nobody out there, at least that I've ever found, that gives advice or has written the book for like the median journey of the entrepreneur, because so much of, of what we write about, so much of the advice that gets given is from those that achieve the 1% success, not from the sort of predictable uh, kind of end state of the entrepreneurial journey. And so, you know, for me, that ambition ran into the wall of anxiety and depression. Um, ultimately, we ended up exiting the company, but it wasn't a meaningful exit from a returning capital point of view. Um, I ended up, thankfully, finding research like Dr. Freeman, spending an awful lot of time in therapy, um, spending an awful lot of time out writing and, and out in nature and, and trying to sort of figure myself out. And then what I realized as I started investing in other entrepreneurs is that they were all, or many of them were going through the same journey that I was. And so um, that was what then inspired me to try to write a book to help other people and, and to write the book that I desperately wish that somebody had given me as I was going through my journey. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. And um, I really appreciate that you shared that part of the story for everybody else in the room. There's another part to the story and it and, and ends up with a happy ending, but maybe this is a good place to stop um, for now. And, I'm, and I appreciate that you shared that you did get professional help too. That's, um, that's uh, we can come back to discuss that later, but let me ask um, Dr. Johnson, uh, Sherry, what did we just hear? Like what happened inside Eric's mind and his brain? <laughs> And and he asked the question of does he have a gene for this? Uh, from a from the thirty thousand foot level, what what is that story about? Sure. Um, if you want, I can go ahead and even just start my talk and walk people through a little bit about these brain systems. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, and Eric, thank you for such an amazing talk. I haven't focused as much about what happens when ambition and failure collide. And I'm happy to come back to that um, because I think it's really a salient and important piece. Let me see if I can share my screen um, because I'm gonna show you pictures of brains. Um, but don't worry, I won't, I won't geek out for too long. Um, but I wanna kind of talk a little bit today um, uh, really in depth about what this system looks like. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm an entrepreneur wannabe with friends. I formed my first LLC at 16 and I'm fascinated by goal setting and ambition um, in part because for decades I've studied bipolar disorder where there's a lot of dysregulation in goal setting. Um, and then with Michael, I've been doing research on entrepreneurship. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how your brain processes reward and what goes into being ambitious at a neurobiological level. I'm going to touch briefly on some of what we know to be benefits of ambition, which I think everybody in this room knows. Um, but I'll just use that as a jumping off point for like, when is ambition actually a problem? Is it ever something we should worry about? 
And then I'm going to end with a few tips about warding off those problems. So do a thought experiment with me for a minute here. Imagine that you want to eat some chocolate or you want to be a pop star or you want to earn a million dollars or you want to become an entrepreneur and even disrupt an entire industry. The real question is how does your brain help you do that? What does your brain have to mobilize for you to pursue that goal? And it turns out that what we're really talking about here is a motivation system in the brain. And for a long, long time, researchers have thought about the idea that there's really actually two motivation systems. Some people call the first one an approach or activation system, and the second one an avoidance or inhibition system. But this first one is about how you go after rewards, dreams, opportunities, good stuff. And this second one shapes much more about how you avoid the threats and punishments. We're going to focus here. We're going to be all about the rewards today. Decades ago, Chuck Carver, my colleague, created a scale to measure kind of how strongly do you tend to reward to respond to rewards. And it has simple questions. You can find it online on the web and you can ask yourself questions like, when I get something I want, I feel excited and energized. How much is that true? When I see an opportunity for something I like, I get excited right away. And you can use the scale to kind of measure individual differences. So my favorite cartoon character in the world is, is Tigger. Tigger is very, very reward sensitive, and I'm guessing um, many of you are fans of Tigger, but we all also know Eeyores. And the reason I use these is because Tigger can get excited about just about anything, and Eeyore is always sort of moping around that no matter what's going on, has a really hard time getting activated and excited. We know a lot about the neurobiology of this system. People talk about the ventral tegmentum and the nucleus accumbens is central in what happens with reward processing. More specifically, there are neurons between these two hubs in the brain that are dopaminergic. And so we talk about the dopamine mesolimbic system. It's actually a lot more complicated, and I'm not going to go into all the pieces um, because those two regions are going to be central characters in our story today. Way back in the 50s, anyone who took an intro psych class may have seen this already. Um, Olds and Milner inserted wires into rat brains and set it up so that a rat could press a lever and send a current down into the nucleus accumbens to activate it, and found that rats would press that lever up to 2,000 times an hour. They were so excited to press that lever that they would keep pressing that lever to the point where they would not go after food or water. And in fact, rats in that experiment died. It's a sort of signal of how powerfully animals and us are programmed to respond to reward. It is innate and hardwired. We don't put wires into people's brains, but we do put them into scanners, the fMRI machines, to look at what happens with the nucleus accumbens. And we can see that in humans too, if you're expecting a reward, the nucleus accumbens becomes more active. There's more blood flow to that region. We can trigger off nucleus accumbens activation by showing you a picture of your loved one when you're in the scanner, showing moms pictures of their babies, showing you sexy pictures, showing you pictures of chocolates, even um, giving you a chance to plot revenge after you've just had somebody say something mean to you. And certainly very powerfully and very robustly by giving you a chance to play a game where you could win money. And so the nucleus accumbens, it's pretty clear, activates to rewards or cues of potential rewards. And so it's central in kind of coming online when you're about to go after a goal and go after an opportunity. So back to our Tigger and Eeyore, I think what we could say about Tigger is that his dopamine increases in the nucleus accumbens much more profoundly given a small reward than Eeyore's. And so there's a neurobiological Tigger kind of circuitry, basically. I've never put him in a scanner. I would have liked to. 
Now, so what the dopamine and nucleus accumbens activity does is it sets the stage for goal pursuit. It gets you ready to go after those goals. And to do that, what happens when this is on high is people have more excitement, more energy, and more confidence. But what's really interesting is it works like a cog wheel, where if you move these outcomes, you also move this system. And so if you start to engage in goal pursuit, you bump up activity in this system. And in turn, you turn on the excitement, energy, and confidence. So it's bi-directional. Abraham Lincoln actually used to hack this. One of his friends, when Abe was president, one of Abe's friends sends him a letter and says, Dear Abe, I'm in the worst way. I'm so depressed. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. And Abe writes this letter back and says, when I'm in that way, the only thing I know to do is find one goal and move towards it. There's Abe hacking his dopamine nucleus accumbens system to increase these outputs. Animal studies have helped us understand more. And what we know from the ability to manipulate these regions in the brain very precisely is that what happens if you deplete nucleus accumbens is a rat will still want sugar over plain chow. It just won't work for it. And they can titrate the level of dopamine in the rat brain to um, correlate with how much of a ramp will that rat run up to get to a better reward. Basically, how much effort would you expend to get towards your goal? Now, imagine you're a person like Eric, who your whole life has just had an easy ability to bring dopamine and nucleus accumbens online. That ramp's going to look like nothing. You run up it like there's nothing. And when that happens, you get a surge of energy more easily. And it's easier to think about pursuing the tough goals in life because Ramp? What ramp? I'm running. So how does any of this relate to the real world? <laughs> there you go, Eric. Nobody ever released you. I, I ever probably compared you to rats running up a ramp. Um, I've but... been compared to worse. It's OK. <laughs> All right. So what do we know about entrepreneurs in this system? Entrepreneurs are incredibly sensitive to reward. They see opportunities and they, they're, they glom onto them. They're also, though, much more willing than other people to work hard, and they set high goals. They're ambitious. What do we know about this system in mental health? Well, we know that being depressed suppresses it. Um, major depression has been tied profoundly to diminished activity in these systems. We know that when people are manic, this system goes into hyperdrive. Um, and in fact, that, that elements of this system being sensitive are there before the mania even ever comes on during a person's life and are there, you know, as a kind of risk indicator. And we know that ADHD shapes some of the kind of time course of how this system responds. So people are much more responsive to what's happening immediately and not, um, and, and so have a kind of hypersensitivity to the moment of reward. I find this fascinating because people with bipolar disorder, at least when their symptoms are mild enough not to trash their self-esteem terribly, are more likely to want to become entrepreneurs. They're actually more likely to become entrepreneurs. And if they get the chance to be an entrepreneur, they show more financial success and creativity as entrepreneurs. Michael can tell you a lot about that. The other thing about ambition that's fascinating is if you look at school kids and other structured settings, ambition is the number one predictor in a lot of studies of whether people accomplish more. I'm not surprised that Eric became president of every club because that kind of effortless energy um, gets things done and moves things and is charismatic. So why would we ever worry about ambition? Well, beyond the whole kind of failure side. And of course, failure is easier if you set high goals. If I want to bike 100 miles, it's less likely I'm going to get there than if I set my, my exercise goal of biking a mile. But other than that, the problems would be if the goals are too high, too intense, or too dysregulated. And I want to talk about each of these three. 
uh, we created a scale to look at hyperambition. Uh, uh, oops, and uh, it has lots of things that are statistically improbable. And what we found is there were a group of people that wanted all of these. They wanted to be president. They wanted to earn $20 million. They wanted to write a book, be extremely popular. They didn't just want one of them. Um, turns out people with bipolar disorder tend to be highly ambitious. So do entrepreneurs. Um, I will just say it's easier to have overly high goals when they're extrinsic. Things like money, admiration, and power are limitless. There's only so much intimacy, life satisfaction, and emotional well-being you can have. So intrinsic goals have their own kind of limit. These are limitless. And so they're sort of more insatiable goals. It's easier to become overly ambitious. And it predicts more decline over time in life satisfaction if you focus on these as your goals in life. So these are the places where it's easier to set goals that are a little too high and get people into trouble. OK, so that's what I'm going to say about high ambitions, although we can come back to that. I also want to kind of talk about the quality with which people pursue their ambitions. And because I think that this is a state that people get into when their entrepreneurship stuff starts to happen, where suddenly the goal gets to be too urgent. And they're so busy going, going, going after the kind of next possibility that they cannot slow down for reflection, to gather advice, to evaluate the risks. There's this sort of state of strike while the iron's hot that gets dangerous because people aren't processing risks and they make mistakes, they overspend, they don't budget in the same way, but also because they make too many sacrifices. They give up on other goals about sleep, family, and health. And so it's just a sense of too much urgency. The other way we see this come through is people get kind of really bound up in it's got to be perfect in a way that they crowd out other people and collaborators. And so this kind of intensity of the way they're seizing that goal and trying to hold on to it um, is a kind of trouble spot. And then the other thing, coming back to the idea that once you start going after goal pursuit, the very thing that Abe Lincoln knew to do to get out of depression, you bump up this system, you bump up the nucleus accumbens. And when the nucleus accumbens goes into hyperdrive, it's a state, it's a temporary state where people are less sensitive to threats and costs. And that makes them more rash and impulsive in this kind of urgent go, go, go state. And it's also going to make them less interpersonally sensitive. And so when people get really pumped up in that state, there's a chance of just making more mistakes and being more impulsive in a way that can be really costly in the middle of these really delicate ventures. So what do you need to do? What does any of this science tell us? Well, I think for one thing, it's important to know your own style. What is your own level of ambition at baseline? But also, how urgent does it all get for you once you go into goal mode? Um, do you get blind to risks? Do you abandon other goals? Is your partner suddenly furious at you because you've forgotten that you had a family? And because it's state dependent and it gets kind of you get kind of blinders if you have that urgency. Think ahead of time about what's too much sacrifice. What are you going to set as your goal for protecting your finances, your sleep, your health, your social world, your family? Like what is enough sacrifice and what's too much? Because in that moment, your judgment's going to veer off. Eric, I loved that you put yourself back into nature, kind of refocusing yourself on the intrinsic well-being goals is a really good antidote to that urgent state versus the kind of there's more money and there's bigger growth kind of framework. And, and, and every one of these were absolutely critical for me kind of getting back to a more normative state, 100%. Awesome. Um, Commit to self-checks, knowing that it's a dynamic brain system. You're going to fluctuate, and you need a system where you check in with yourself. If there's any one regulator on this system, it's sleep. If you sleep eight hours, you re-regulate your dopamine receptors in your brain. So this idea that you'll do better if you get less sleep, forget it. You lose some of your judgment, and that's been shown in entrepreneurship research. Um, and then the other thing, knowing that you're 
probably going to be in a kind of high intensity state if you're one of these folks nominate a coach that works with you and is a voice of calm um jake you are profound in taking on this role of kind of encouraging people to attend to their well-being so uh, i am happy to answer any questions but those are just kind of an outline of some things that i think about and we can come back to any of them and we'll, um, after we hear from Jake, we'll have time for discussion. Um, thank you, Sherry. That was a terrific overview. Um, and uh, Jake, actually, before we uh, kind of engage in some dialogue, if you had, despite what Eric said at the beginning, if you had invested in him, you would have done very well, uh, eventually. Um, but on the other hand, you a lot of people like uh, like Eric come into your office every day and they're pitching their great business idea and they're full of enthusiasm and they have a lot of energy and they, uh, you know, they they work really hard. And as uh, Sherry just said, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So what is your filter? How do you evaluate the Eric's of the world in the context of what uh, you know from people like Sherry and how do you find that balance? And then once you've committed to an entrepreneur by investing in their company, uh, what have you found to be useful to um, prevent them from going off the rails or at least to help? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, I mean, as, as you found out in your work and as, as Sherry highlighted, and as I think most entrepreneurs know, um, most entrepreneurs are neuroatypical, they're not normal. And by normal, I mean sort of the normal bell curve, right? Um, and we're not looking to invest in people who are in that normal part of the bell curve because those aren't people who are really gonna change the world, right? Um, and so if you're at one of the ends of the spectrum, that means that like you have some brilliance, but you also have some things you have to work through. So, I mean, one, one thing we look for, obviously, is just an audacious goal, a drive to do something big and interesting and compelling that, like, we are also passionately interested in seeing, like, live in the world. Um, and then working with you, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later when I talk about exactly what we do, but figuring out what your gaps are um, and then helping you, you know, A, patch those gaps and then B, surround yourself with the right people that um, can help sort of get you over the hurdle. Um, so there is certainly, yeah, we, we sort of acknowledge that people have gaps and then just tr try and figure out how we can help them work through those things. And I think that's the only thing you really can do when you're looking for people, specifically looking for people who are not normal, um, which I don't mean in a pejorative sense, but just in sort of a, it's just the way entrepreneurs work. Um, before I dive into um, kind of our story or my story and and how we got to where we are at Alpha Bridge, I'd like to just like highlight one thing that Eric said that I think is super interesting, which is he brought up this uh, selection bias and like myth in entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. And I think it really is one of the core problems and you see it everywhere. So you see it in TechCrunch, right? You see companies left and right raising series A's from Andreessen and Horowitz and Sequoia and you hear how easy it is to access money these days. But what you don't hear about are the thousands of companies that aren't raising money. You're just hearing about the companies that are. And it makes it look like everybody can do it very easily. And it's not true. There's myths inside the companies, right? There are myths that the CEOs are telling to their employees to get everyone excited and passionate about the mission. They all feel like they're on the next rocket ship, and that their equity is going to be worth millions of dollars, right? And those myths are important so that everyone is on the same page and working hard. There are... Um, myths that the speakers are telling, like Eric said, like the speakers that you're going to hear from are the people who have been successful. But what they're really telling you, they're not telling you, this is how you succeed. They are telling you, this is how I succeeded, which in many ways is like telling you their strategy for picking lotto numbers. They don't really know what it is that makes for a successful founder. But you hear their story and you think, ah, if I do X and Y, I can do everything that they've done. And if I do X and Y and I can't achieve what they've achieved, like clearly there's a problem with me. And that's, it's just not true. 
uh, there are the myths that the venture firms tell, right? A venture firm will have a portfolio of hundreds of companies. And the only ones you hear about are the ones that have IPO'd or have signed a major partnership agreement. You don't hear about all of the companies that are struggling in their portfolio because they're not incentivized to tell you about those things. And then you have venture firms that are logo buying where they're going out and just investing in companies at a late stage that are already successful and then touting it as their own success. And then the final myth, I mean, there's hundreds of myths, but like the final myth is uh, you never hear about the companies that fail, right? Those logos just like slowly disappear from a venture firm's website. The website of the company doesn't get updated, but no one makes the announcement. And so you only hear about the successes when in reality, there are way more failures than successes. So what does that do? What it does is it creates unrealistic expectations for success in founders who are super energetic, super ambitious, have been successful their whole life, and are the personality types that, that Sherry was talking about, where they have this drive to succeed, and it sets them up for failure and for imposter syndrome and for depression because they think everyone is successful. Why aren't they successful? Why can't they make it happen? And it's because not everyone's successful, but the, there's a, just a major selection bias in the stories that we tell about Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship. Um, so I just wanna get that out of the way. I think that's a driver for a lot of the problems that we see. Um, and the, prob the problem is that everyone is incentivized to tell these myths in different ways. I guess it leads to depression, uh, imposter syndrome. The one thing I didn't mention that it leads to, it also leads to fraud. Um, so you, you get situations like uh, Theranos, right? Um, and other, I mean, we had, fraud at Alpha Bridge too, but um, yeah, a huge problem. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, who Alpha Bridge is and kind of where we got to where we are today. And it's, it's a personal story for me. Um, so I, I was running a venture firm prior to my current fund and I was coming to the conclusion of running that fund. I had some partners that I wasn't really mission aligned with. I was investing in a lot of companies that I found to be just really, really boring although good businesses. So you think like traditional enterprise SaaS, stuff like that. Uh, and I, I went through what I call my quarter life crisis, which I think is really um, optimistic since I'm 40. Uh, but, you know, I'm a tech investor. So I think that we're all going to live forever anyway. Um, I was trying to figure out like, do I want to keep doing the easy thing and do another fund with these partners? Uh, do I want to keep investing in the companies I'm investing, which I think are good businesses? Do I want to like dramatically change my life, do something risky? And I went on a program put on by a group called Reboot, um, run by Jerry Colonna, which is in, in many ways thought of as like the sort of a gold standard for founder coaching. But once a year, they do a program specifically targeted at investors. I was like, I'm going to go spend a weekend and try and like think through these things. Um, and what I realized on that weekend, I really had a bunch of realizations. So the first was that um, I should only be investing in businesses that I am personally really passionate about and want to see live in the world. Um, whether or not I find other businesses that I think are boring and great, like I should invest in those because there are better investors for those businesses. If I'm not thinking about you all the time in my off hours and like really want to see you succeed, why should I be the investor for you? For me, that meant investing in mostly frontier tech, deep tech stuff. I grew up watching Star Trek and the vision that Gene Roddenberry had for the world of radical abundance. And everyone is basically free to be an explorer. But the way I interpret that is everyone in his world is basically free to self-actualize, right? It's, exploration means something different for everybody. And I wanted to build that. So I only invest today in those kinds of companies. I realized I wasn't mission aligned with my partners. And so... The easy thing to do is to raise another fund with them. The really risky, hard thing to do is to go out on my own and uh, raise money elsewhere. Um, but that's what I had to do because I was always going to be unhappy or felt held back if I didn't make that change. And then I had this like meta realization, which was I had just spent three days of like focused work with some great coaches. It's only three days, but those three days had been like absolutely life changing and transformational for me. So what if I go out and I create a venture firm where we do that for our founders on a daily basis? Wouldn't that be like the highest leverage thing I could possibly do as an investor, like the greatest gift I could give to my founders? And that was the seed crystal for what ultimately became Alpha Bridge, the, the firm I run today. Um, it took a long time to figure out exactly what it was going to look like. Um, initially, we thought we were just going to do it ourselves. My, my new partner and I were going to be coaches, basically, and coach our founders. We were just going to focus on leadership development and coaching. 
uh, quickly realized we were not at all qualified. So we brought on uh, a partner, wasn't a partner at the time, Dr. Carrie Solons, to do a, a study for us. We brought her in, we had her meet with a dozen of our founders for three hours each, interview them, figure out like the real hard problems in their life, what they were all struggling with, and put together a report on the common struggles um, amongst founders, um, all done anonymously. And then take that report and turn it into, if you were going to build something for founders, what would you build to solve these problems? Um, because that's what we wanted to build. And the report Carrie put together was absolutely amazing. We brought her on as a partner to, to run it for us and build it internally. Um, and we ended up, we called that Atlas or Project Atlas at the time. Um, and one of the things we realized is Howie and I, we were just focused on leadership development. But uh, what, what Kari brought to our attention was, for founders to be their best, it really involves a lot of work around physical health. Uh, are you getting sleep? Like, like Sherry mentioned, enough sleep. Are you eating right? Are you exercising and getting out into the world? And if you're not physically healthy, how can you possibly be mentally and emotionally healthy? And then there's the mental and emotional part. So, you know, you should be seeing a therapist. You should have a co-founder therapist, which is like a marriage and family therapist, but like helps you work through your business communications and, and internal problems. Um, are you spending enough time with your family and friends? Or are you like sort of alienating all of the relational aspects of your life? And if you're not taking the time to focus on the emotional and mental health in your life, then you can't work on what it takes to be a great leader. So physical health, mental and emotional health are like the legs of the stool that being a great leader sits on. Then we can start working with you on how do you build a strong company culture? How do you bring your managers along so that they can be executives one day? How do you inspire your team and create a vision? And so the program we ended up creating was we can't just focus on coaching. We have to focus on absolutely everything. And how do we help founders address all these aspects of their life, uh, which is a, a tall order. Um, so what we ended up doing is brought carry on, raised the fund, very small fund. Um, but we had, we negotiated with our limited partners. So the people who give us money that we can then invest in companies to use a portion of the fund that we raised to support our founders so that we could pay for the programming for all of our founders. Um, what the programming looks like is when founders come in and talk with us, we decide to invest in them. We have them meet with, with Kari and her team. Uh, Matt, who's actually on the call today, um, is, is one of the team members, or actually he's leading it now. Um, and we help them figure out their strengths and weaknesses and what they wanna work on in their life. And then we make a custom program for everybody. So we don't do everything for everybody, but we try and plug the gaps as best we can, which goes back to Michael's question. How do we, how do we deal with this? Or how do we address the founders that, that have these gaps but are audacious and compelling? I mean, that's how we do it. Um, so that's what we do. I guess you could ask why we do it. I think it's an interesting question. Um, we do it for a whole bunch of reasons. One, I think it's the right thing to do. I was having a conversation the other day with, with a friend. Um, and I was saying that I think the venture industry is a lot like the timber industry in that it's, it's a highly extractive industry, right? Like I make all of my money on the blood, sweat and tears of founders. Um, not that like my job is easy because it's certainly very stressful to be a venture capitalist, but I'm like the lumberjack out there harvesting the trees that the founders have, have built. And I think you can be a responsible timber company or an irresponsible timber company. You can go clear cut old growth forest which I think was the traditional model of venture and just take, or you can do what I think we do, which is plant the new seedlings, support the trees you have, harvest responsibly, right? Like that's the way I think that we do venture. I think it's the right way to do it. The other reason we do what we do is I honestly think that our returns are gonna outperform the market at the end of the day, because one of the key failure points for companies, once you get past the seed stage, maybe past series A, isn't product market fit anymore. It isn't technology. It's the people behind the business. It's like, does the CEO, like, do they make the jump from being someone tinkering in a garage to being a leader at a company? Like, do they burn out and like disappear for six months? Like, are they making the right decisions? And the way you solve for that is like helping them with like this very personal side of running a business. And I think our companies will outperform because we do that. That's another reason why we do it. 
And then like very uh, sort of Machiavellian, as a, as a venture firm, we're competing against other firms to get into deals all the time, especially the, the deals that are most compelling by one metric or another in the market. And uh, this is like a real differentiator point for us. So when I'm talking to a founder about their business and saying, you should take my money, I'm not selling my money. I am selling myself and the program we've built and everything we offer to founders, right? So don't just take my money, take my money and my support because I care about you as a person because I really want to see you succeed. Um, and so I think it, it's been wonderful for us in terms of the deals we see. We get a lot of founder referrals sending us their founder friends. Uh, we get into competitive deals all the time. We've gotten preferential terms because of what we offer. Um, and one of the big risks for small funds like ours is that you invest in a company. We invest in a broad portfolio of companies. Again, sort of like the selection bias two or three companies that we invest in are gonna drive all the returns for us. The rest, just because it's the way the market works, will succeed, but like on a lower level where it doesn't really move the needle for the firm or won't succeed or whatever. The biggest risk for a small fund like ours is that you invest a little bit of money in one of your major winners, and then you get cut out by the biggest investors in later rounds, you can't get in. Um, and so you don't get to put more money to work in the companies that are gonna perform the best. Uh, the way we keep from being cut out is we become the support network for all the founders we invest in. And so when the founder is deciding who gets to put money in in the next round after their breakout success, uh, it's always going to be us. It's always going to be us because we actually care about the founder. We build an authentic relationship. But we offer a ton of value in addition to our money. Um, so I think we get a ton of value out of providing value back to founders. Um, and yeah. I, uh, I think that's my 15 minutes. I could keep going on about what we do, but uh, I'd love to open it up to Q and A uh, and dig yeah, in. Yeah, let's do that. That was, uh, I think three really profound presentations. I am so grateful to all three of you.